In the mid-1980s, I was asked by an American legal institution known as the Christic Institute to compile a comic book which would detail the murky history of the CIA from the end of the Second World War to the present day, covering things such as the heroin smuggling during the Vietnam War, the cocaine smuggling during the war in Central America, the Kennedy assassination and other highlights. What I learned during the frankly horrifying research that I had to slog through to accomplish this was that, yes, there is a conspiracy. In fact, there are a great number of conspiracies that are all tripping each other up. And all of those conspiracies are run by paranoid fantasists and ham-fisted clowns. If you are on a list targeted by the CIA, you really have nothing to worry about. If, however, you have a name similar to somebody on a list targeted by the CIA, then you are dead. The main thing that I learned about conspiracy theory is that conspiracy theorists actually believe in a conspiracy because that is more comforting. The truth of the world is that it is chaotic. The truth is that it is not the Jewish banking conspiracy, or the grey aliens, or the 12-foot reptiloids from another dimension that are in control. The truth is far more frightening. Nobody is in control. The world is rudderless. That's our word, uh, brought to you by the Illuminati. And of course, this is uh, not covered by anything. No rights reserved, but all mites reserved. And I'm here with uh, Larry Bernard, the shit poster extraordinaire, and uh, was it 32nd degree Mason? 32nd degree honorary grand inspector general. Sounds fancy. I think that's what the panel is. Uh, let me double check that. <laughs> I, I'm ruining my. They may have upgraded, I wanna, you, you may have upgraded you while you were looking. <laughs> um, oh, shit, right, I'm all so this there is, 33 now. <laughs> yeah, give me a moment here. But yes, there's uh, 32 degrees in the Scottish Rite, which is completely separate from the uh, regular branches of masonry, but that's a whole other story. Okay. So normally what I do on these episodes is... Um, on the 25th episodes, I usually do a solo episode and I was really kind of interested in the Denver airport conspiracies and I didn't think that would fill enough to do a whole show. So I wanted to talk about Freemasons as well. And I know that you contacted me and said, Hey, I'd, I'd like to, to be on your show sometime. And I was like, well, you know, I'm actually going to start and I am going to do this. I'm actually going to start like an interview show where I interview guests and stuff. Nice. And so instead of doing that and, uh, you know, instead of just having like guests on the show, it's still going to be in the same feed and everything. It'll be just a separate show that everybody who subscribes to the Lulberts will get as well. Um, nice. Yeah. So that's that's the plan. And then I was like, you know what? It'd be a better idea to, to bring you on and answer some of the questions that most people would have when it comes to Freemasonry and the Illuminati and all this other stuff. And we can also talk about the Denver airport conspiracy as well. Cause that's not, dun, dun, take, dun. yeah, it's not going to take too much time. Um, Pardon me. The, so the correct terminology okay. is in the Southern jurisdiction is the 32nd degree is a master of the Royal secret. The inspector general is what you get when you get the 33rd degree. Okay. Which we'll talk about. I'm sure because yeah. <laughs> everybody wants to know about that. Yeah. Okay. So let's just get right into it. Then. Um, now we have to bear in mind you are a shit poster, so <laughs> absolutely. But there's certain things that you're that you're not at liberty to talk about, which is understandable, right? right. I think most the, organizations. The basic, the basic expression used internally is signs, how one mason will recognize another one, secret handshake stuff, secret password stuff. Those are your primary things that are explicitly excluded. Mm -hmm. Now. It varies state to state what each state regulates within its own Masonic code as a uh, secret part of the work. Okay, so it's not a really centralized thing, right? So different no, Freemasons. not the United States. So different free, like a like a bunch of Freemasons in uh, 
you know, Las Vegas, Nevada will have different rules and regulations and different connections okay. and stuff like that from other other organizations. So, but, but before, so in the United States, well, hold on, okay. let, we'll, we'll get in, let's get into that. If, if I'm wrong on that, I, I'd like to know. But we should we'll, probably we'll not on that. Yeah, we'll not let's not bury the lead. What, what are <laughs> what are the Freemasons? <laughs> I think uh, Freemasonry it. is one of, if not the oldest world's fraternity. It gets really hazy because back in the 18th and 17th century, people didn't really keep good records. Uh, Freemasonry in the United Kingdom recently had its 300th anniversary, and it's an organization for men to uh, get together and be better men. Okay. So it's basically kind of like um, maybe like the Rotary Club with less charitable kind of activities. Rotary More Club charitable or... activities, actually. Oh, really? Yeah. They just. So, I, guess, I guess they just try kind of hospitals. Put... Okay. For crippled children, as a prime example, the Shriners are all Freemasons. Okay. And the Shrine Hospital is the most well-known Masonic charity. Okay. Uh, maybe Do you guys just don't put your name on as much stuff when you guys do uh, charitable work? Because that's probably why we, I get the perception that's the case. Uh, um, things like the Shriners Hospital, they have the best advertising budget because the hospital's for crippled oh. children. Um, Can't the be Grotto, that. Which, <laughs> which is another organization I belong to. They provide dental care for disabled and um, other types of children. So that doesn't really get a lot of things. Um, in some states, the Grand Lodge will sponsor as their principal charity a retirement home for its own members. Yeah. Um, in some states, they'll do like a teaching hospital. And your local Masonic Lodge, they may you know donate to literally any charity that's active in your local area. Okay, because when I was living in Wichita, um, they actually have a really big, um, I guess it's a hospital slash nursing home um, over there, and it's really big, and I almost I almost ended up getting a job there. <laughs> mm-hmm. And then, of course, everybody would have been like, ah, con- you know, Illuminati confirmed. <laughs> <laughs> so is is the freemason part of the illuminati i think that's like one of the biggest things ever is that people will use like nwo illuminati and freemasonry as one kind of well, bundle and they'll just talk about it as the illuminati first things first okay freemasonry predates the formation of the bavarian illuminati by many years okay so uh, how many years is a matter of debate but so first of all freemasonry predates the illuminati secondly the founder of the Illuminati was a Freemason and was likely trying to form the Illuminati into a Masonic organization. And third, most importantly, he and all of his initial members were arrested and put in jail mm. for conspiracy against the king. Okay. That, that's a part of the story nobody likes to talk about. Yeah, because, you know, if they are controlling the the all of the world's governments, you would expect them to be arrested by all the world's governments right. that they, they Now, they of control. course, the Illuminati conspiracy theory was one of the many anti-Masonic conspiracy theories that was paid for and sponsored by the Catholic Church. Okay, so there's a feud with the Catholic Church, then. It's complicated. The Catholic Church has a disagreement with us, and we say, uh, okay, buddy, whatever. <laughs> Now, it gets complicated, and that gets into global trends in Freemasonry. So, in the United States, Great Britain, Ireland, Australia, Freemasonry is fairly mainstream, but in certain parts of the world that are more Catholic and Latin, it tends to be involved in a lot of the politics involving the Catholic Church within the larger society. So, if your opponent's political party was the pro-church party, you became a Freemason and joined the opposing party. So there's things built into there. Also a clandestine Masonic organization, which is a Masonic organization that's formed either illegitimately or does not conform to normal Masonic principles, did help the Italian revolutionaries take most of the Pope's land in Italy. However, the Catholic Church does, as a general policy, oppose almost every fraternal organization okay we're just the biggest one they oppose because we're the most well-known one okay and is there any relationship to um other quote-unquote secret societies uh that are probably also known in the mainstream like what is the skull and bones is, is there other ones too yeah i'm sure there's <sighs> there other is ones. no awesome. confirmed connection 
Skull and Bones was formed as a college fraternity, and a lot of the college fraternities that were formed back then were at least to some degree exposed to Masonic ideas. And a lot of the other fraternities that developed independently around the same time did a lot of things similar. Okay. Um, Bohemian Grove, other than some members of Bohemian Grove being Freemasons, there's no connection. Yeah. Uh, that, that was one of the things that I was going to actually ask you about, which I already know the answer to, <laughs> yeah. was the uh, the Bohemian Grove, because a lot of people allege it. Oh, this is a lot of this is Illuminati Freemasonry uh, stuff. No, no, and, uh, no, Bohemian so, Grove's just a club for rich and important people to go be away from everybody else. Yeah. And it's mostly kind of founded in the skull and bones and not the Freemasons. Yeah. Okay. So, um, is <laughs> we're we're going right through these. Um, if you want to expand on any of these, let me know. Oh, yeah. yeah. So, um, is the uh, is the Freemasons <clears throat> a satanic? Uh, satanic. No. Okay. In fact, all the Masonic ritualism in your primary three degrees is based on symbols and symbolism from the Bible. Okay. And if you are a Satanist, at least a proper Satanist, not a pseudo Satanist, but if you okay. are if you are a Satanist, we're, we're, you cannot join uh the Freemasons. But that's because Satanism as of the type belonging to Anton Sandor LeVay and mm-hmm. his cohorts are all all atheistic organizations. Right. With a f- notable exceptions within the world of clandestine and irregular masonry, you have to believe in God. Okay. In some capacity. Yeah, or a higher was it a higher power? I think a higher power. Basically, if it could pass for God for Alcoholics Anonymous, it would work for Freemasonry. <laughs> okay, <laughs> so uh, can your higher power be a Brock? Because <laughs> that's one of the things I keep getting told about okay. AA. So yeah, so here's where it comes down to is at a philosophical standpoint. You're going to take an obligation before God. So number one, you have to believe in God for that obligation to mean something. Okay. Number two, you have to believe that there are consequences for you telling God to, you know, F you, I'm going to do what I want. Well, you can cuss on this show, so you can say fuck you. Yeah. Okay. So, <laughs> so it could in theory be a rock, but realistically, a rock's not going to be there to hold you accountable for your actions. Unless it's a Neil Breen magic rock, I guess. Exactly. Okay. If it's a Neil Breen cancer cured <laughs> rock, all bets are off. Okay. <laughs> I'm all for that. Yeah, um, I've been really kind of delving into Satanism. I'm really enjoying it. I thought it was going to be something completely different. <laughs> it was really when I, you know, before then. But it's like this. A lot of this stuff makes a whole lot of sense. Um, that 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 will be a discussion for another time. We can go into all sorts of fun with that. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, um, so what's the next on your hit parade? Uh, so the next on my hit parade. Uh, oh, did I close the window? Yes, I. No, it's one of these. Okay, I got like eight tabs open. Or I got eight windows open with like 30 tabs open in each. That one's not it. No, close. Eventually. Oh, Jesus. I'm a, I'm a, I'm a professional. Did I mention that I'm a professional here? You you, you are <laughs> dis, uh, displaying all the traits of professionalism. Yeah. Oh boy, where's my list? Okay. Um, I think we kind of went through all the ones that are on this list. Well, yeah, let me so. bring up so. another important thing, primarily for Americans, that's going to be relevant later when we talk about and very important nonsense. What, what is that? Uh, there's going to be a particular point that's relevant to the American Masonic historical tradition that will be important for later because it's going to be referenced when we talk about the Denver Airport nonsense. Okay. There, is, there was at one point in time segregation in Freemasonry okay. due to a lot of cultural factors that are both not surprising to the United States, but are also specifically and bizarrely Masonic. Okay. So during the Revolutionary War, there were these things called military lodges. Groups of soldiers came together, formed special lodges with the special jurisdiction of certain soldiers. People of color who were fighting for the British military formed lodges. And after the war, not all those people left. Of the people who stayed, they maintained lodges for a certain period of time. It was in the 1830s or 40s, I think. I'd have to double-check that when that wrapped up. They maintained operation under British jurisdiction. 
The Brits, however, were merging their lodges and trying to basically be the the not so much the leader of the global Freemasonry, but the first among equals. So as part of that as a political standard, they said, listen, uh, go rejoin the Grand Lodge nearest to you. For the lodges that were for primarily white people who fought in the British military, that wasn't a problem. Obviously, if you were a freedman, you, you were having a problem. So they formed their own system of Masonic lodges and built their own Masonic traditions, which have certain unique things beyond that. Now, we've been going through a process since the 80s of bringing the two Grand Lodge systems together as part of one big, happy, but slightly dysfunctional family. In but the case you, of Colorado, which is what you, Col I'm sorry. In the case of Colorado, at the point in time that the the capstone for the airport was laid, both of them were working together. Okay, and that's the Prince Hall Grand Lodge system. And you would expect, if these are a, a powerful organization that's controlling the entire world for one global unified agenda, they would be a dysfunctional family. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Okay, so um, is it, was let's that see, another oh. thing is that only men can join. However, there are clandestine and irregular Masonic lodges that primarily come from French origin that allow women in. They're called co-Masons. And as an attempt to defend the Masonic brand in Europe, they created women's lodges that are just for women. And in the United States, we have a... Uh, I believe it's technically classified as an appended body. It might be an allied body, which is women who are wives, sisters, daughters, granddaughters of Freemasons and their male relative. Okay. It's called the Order of the Eastern Star. Is there any particular reason why they're the, why they're still male oriented? Is it or just it's just because you know guys just want to a hang out with with friends? A, it's because of hundreds of years of tradition. Okay. B, Freemasonry is a organization that's focused on morality. How it's focused on morality is an entirely long dissertation of its own. As such, it believes that good men coming together help themselves become better as men. Okay. Um. And it'd be kind Likewise, of weird to just run, just throw women in and say, "All right, we're going to teach you how to be better women." That's by an organization. Friend, yeah, it would be it would be really kind of weird, and I think they would I think they would object to it more than they would object to not being allowed in. Also, <laughs> there's a group of irregular and clandestine masons who also originate in France that don't require you to believe in God, mm. which divided those group of co-masons into those who believe that you have to believe in God and those who don't. Okay. Now, these uh, clandestine Masonic bodies are much smaller and uh, they're not doing as well as mainstream Freemasonry, which is struggling in the United States right now. Okay. So uh, I guess the next question is, 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 uh, is there a Freemasonic conspiracy uh, that was to inject Ian Freeman into the Liberty Movement. No, no, that that was just me okay. because I was a bad kid at school, and uh, hung out I, I told <laughs> and, and I told the person who was running the uh, kids vote election in 1992, "What about the Libertarian candidate?" And uh, because of that, it got added to our school ballot. And that was when Ian Freeman was first exposed to the idea of Libertarianism back in 1992. Oh, so we can pin this all on you then. <laughs> you can pin this on me. Yes, it's my fault. Yeah, I still like Ian. Um, He's a good guy. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I know there's a lot of people that, that hate him for whatever reason. Well, whatever. Um, I can understand some of them, but uh, overall, I think he's an all right yeah. guy. Uh, the the nap stuff can get out of get out of control, though. So the Knights yeah. Templar is there any relationship with that? And wh <sighs> okay. what what exactly is the Knights Templar? I, I think. Well, I've we're gotten... we're we're gonna pull some things apart here. Okay. So first of all, there's the Knights Templar, which were a crusading knightly order. There is no historically verifiable connection. Okay. However, 
There are connections to families that were involved in the earliest days of Scottish Freemasonry that were also connected to Scottish families that were involved in Knights Templary. And there are symbols in their churches that they built during a period before what we now know of as Freemasonry evolved that have very many symbols that are similar to Masonic symbols today, but we don't know if that was the chicken or the egg in oh. that point of discussion. Now, then there's Knights nice Templar. Back that far. Right. We basically have a good idea about Freemasonry going back into the 1500s. There are documents and evidence of Freemasonry going back that far that any Freemason who is knowledgeable on the ins and outs of their organization will recognize it. Then there are things that go back to the 900s that are similar, but there are large scale differences. And this goes into a term of art we use of masonry. There's operative masonry, which are people who actually work with stones. And then Freemasons call themselves speculative masons because Imagine you're back in time, it's the medieval period, it's a guild time. You're not a person rich enough to have proper tutors go to proper schooling, but you're doing something that requires a lot of knowledge, skill, and talent. You're being provided education in a different sort of way. So the earliest Masonic ritualism most likely involved moral, scientific, and other forms of education, but it used ritualism and ceremony to do that as a teaching tool. Oh, okay. Um, so back to the Knights Templar. Now, there is an organization within Freemasonry that's called the Knights Templar. And it was named such because it was inspired by that, and it was dedicated to be a exclusively Christian organization within Freemasonry. Okay. It, and there's a subsection of that that is excluded only to Trinitarian Christians in case you're some kind of Unitarian. <laughs> okay, why? <laughs> uh, I, don't I don't know too much about Unitarian except for them and the Calvinists seem to be the butt of jokes. Yeah, okay. I don't I don't know that much about the history of the formation of the Templar Orders. Okay, okay. I can, yeah. And uh, the other York Rite bodies which are focused more on the spiritual, moral, ethical side of Freemasonry, tend to be much more religious, overtly religiously themed. Okay. So um, I guess the next one, we should delve right into the, not the JQ, but we should talk about the Jews, because a lot of it kind of do, does involve uh, uh, Jewish kind of cons anti-Semitic kind of territory with some of these conspiracies. Okay, well, theories. first of all, the same person who was writing anti-Masonic conspiracy theory stuff for the Catholic Church was also writing anti-Jewish conspiracy theory stuff for the Catholic Church. Okay. And he apologized on his deathbed for both of those. Okay. Is, is, this, one of those, I... is this one of those deathbed confessions? That yeah, like, it's like uh, the Catholic Church paid me to be a horrible person. Oh, it was one of those. Okay. Yeah. It was a legit one. It wasn't kind of like, oh, you know, Anton LaVey recanted on its deathbed or uh, Darwin yeah. or uh, you know, Christopher Hitchens. It's not one of those things. We're just like, we're just going to say it's true. Yeah. Or Penn Jillette is now a Christian. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Because <laughs> exactly. that's a weird video. Um, Basically, this guy, for a period of his life, he was a very vehement anti-Catholic. Then he became a Catholic for a while, and then he wrote a whole bunch of horrible things because the Catholic Church wanted him to write it because, you know, he was a uh, journalist of the era. Okay. This is, was this, do you, is this His guy, name okay. is Leo Taxel. Did they ever figure out who wrote the uh, the Protocols of the Elders of Zion? Was that probably the same guy, maybe? Same guy. He, it was? He, okay. he was? in. He was involved in that. Okay. Yeah, which was a, so, was complete forgery, by the way. <laughs> right, an obvious and uh, obvious likewise, forgery. since the Catholics wrote all that good stuff, a lot of radical Islamic thinkers in the late nineteenth and early twentieth century just decided to run along with that. 
Okay. Yeah, because I, I did notice there was a lot of kind of it gets into weird kind of anti-Semitic stuff sometimes yeah. when I look up some of these um, these things, but not often because I used to be a conspirator, like hardcore conspirator. I mean, mm-hmm. and I'm not talking about people who just maybe think are 9-11 truthers and that's about it. No, like I was really like Bill Cooper. I was really into Bill Cooper for a while. Yeah. <laughs> and he, he had a lot to say about the Freemasons, which I found out that's was like... Time. Now, 99.99% bullshit. I think you got some of the symbols right. Um, okay. <laughs> Jews, Jews were restricted from joining Freemasonry until the late 18th century. And it took a while before Jews gained a full sort of equality in Freemasonry. But, you know, that was happening everywhere anyway. Yeah. So yeah, I can, I can understand like if if there was you know segregation in in these kind of organizations at the time when that was the prevalent kind of cultural norm. Yeah. But if it's if it's kind of like and we're gonna get into Mormons just a bit, but if it's like the Mormons where they're just allowing black people in in the seventies, it's like come on, like mm. <sighs> the Mormon the Mormon Church and Freemasonry. That's such a wonderful topic. Yeah, let's just delve oh, right into that because I, I I love I okay. love, <laughs> I love so Mormon. This happened lore. during the Nauvoo period. But the Mormons were in Illinois, and there was a that's lot where of the them. Gungans live, right? Nabu? No, no, that's Nabu, okay. not Nabu. Oh, okay. So when they were there, they built up a nice sized city, and it was very populated. And so, corrupt Illinois politics being what it is, they allied with corrupt Illinois political machines. And what you did when you were, you know, becoming a person of means at that point in time, you joined the Freemasonry, and then enough Masons in Nabu constituted a community there they formed a lodge and they then proceeded to build up other masonic infrastructure but they were doing it too quickly by the standards of today now by the standards of that day by the standards of today they were doing it in a normal fashion but the standards were higher back then and so the mormons got their um, masonic rights stripped away from them and then the prophet joseph smith had a revelation. Oh wow. God revealed unto him the temple rites of the temple. I always find it's it interesting. So yeah, I find it interesting that the that Mormons usually have all these amazing revel- revelations right when they're in some sort of hot Oh wait, water wait, wait, wait. we're, we're not done. <laughs> and it's so amazing that the revelations would charitably be called um plagiarism from the Illinois Masonic ritual. Yeah. So many years later the state of Utah comes into being, and there are people who are not Mormons in Utah, and they form a Masonic Lodge. Due to the fact that many people correctly viewed the Mormon rituals as a ripoff of Masonic Lodge rituals, Mormons in the state of Utah were prohibited from joining. As the Grand Lodge of Utah classified the Mormon Church up until the 1980s as a clandestine Masonic Lodge. Hmm. But then... The prophet of the Mormon church had another revelation. And the How ritual convenient. was changed in a manner that was not as blatantly obvious a ripoff of Masonic ritual. And then Mormons were allowed to join. Yeah, that's when they started including things like uh, uh, doing, the, doing the stuff to get uh, people into heaven <laughs> yeah. that weren't Mormons. And uh, like I think it was like 10 years ago, the first Mormon Grandmaster of Masons of Utah came into being. Now, this didn't mean Mormons didn't join the Lodge who were from Utah. They would just drive into Nevada or Arizona. Okay. Or Idaho if they were close enough to Idaho. <laughs> I, th- I think there's a strong Mormon for, uh, hold <laughs> there, too. There's there's, yes. so, there's a lot of Mormons here, too, uh, in yes. Nevada. So. Yes. In fact, that's where we have the big Mormon Lodge, uh, too. Yeah. Also, um, Alistair Crowley was also a Freemason, though he joined a Masonic Lodge that was outside of the mainstream of Freemasonry at the time he was a member. Years later, it switched sides in the dispute over what the legitimate Grand Lodge of France was, and it's now a legitimate Grand Lodge, holding the Lodge. And Aleister Crowley just had this habit of joining Masonic bodies that were not really recognized by the status quo of Freemasonry in Anglo America. Okay. And then he joined up and took over 
one of the clandestine Masonic bodies uh, in the UK, which ended up evolving into Ordo Temple Orientis and some of those other occultic organizations down the road. Okay. There's there's a lot to unpack. <laughs> there's a ton of stuff yeah, to unpack. Yeah, the like the, the Freemasons, it, like it makes it seem so simple when you when I was reading Behold a Pale Horse, like oh these guys they have like these bunch of like weird satanic rituals, and they like to put numbers in everything, and and uh, the, you know they have secret things, but I know the secrets, and the secrets is quiet, <laughs> quiet weapons for secret wars, which is garbage. Um, yeah, complete forgery as well. Um, so. Um, so there's there's a lot of masons who hold, hold like very high positions in government and not as many as there used to be. Yeah, I, I've noticed that it does not seem to, like there's even f- the skull and bones kind of people are kind of fading out. I think you got so, like John Kerry, and that's it. So <laughs> and he's gone now. I think Freemasonry goes through various life cycles, and just like you know, any organization, any product, you know, it evolves and changes as it's being consumed. Post World War II, to make it simple, anybody who fought the Nazis was wanting that spirit of camaraderie and fraternity joined a lodge. Also, lodge membership was used as ways by unions to get around the fact that there were union rules on who they should promote, which has since got outlawed because people ruined it for everybody. Um, Then as time went on and that military need for brotherhood and camaraderie declined, Freemasonry kind of has been in an aimless state trying to reinvent itself. So a lot of the guys you saw who were big in government, who were uh, Freemasons, the last one of note that comes to mind is Trent Lott, who's not, I'm not a fan of his. Uh, President Gerald R. Ford was the last Masonic president. He was very active Mason. He was very big into the York Rite charities. But that the guy who's the local small businessman is much more likely to be a Freemason today than the head of a Fortune 500 company. Okay. Yeah, I th- I, th- I, I, can't, I can't even really... Th- Trent Lott, is he even still around? I think he's gone now. <laughs> well, he's not. He's a lobbyist now. Oh, okay. Yeah. He's a professional lobbyist lizard. Yeah. Well, you think he had some controversy back in the early 2000s or something like that, if I remember yeah. correctly? Yeah. Yeah. All right. So um, what's with – I know you can't talk about what the numbers mean and everything, um, but there are kind of like things that um, – that Masonic uh, Masons will do when they when they are either in power or they're in control of some sort of um, project, be it uh, be it Denver Airport or okay the Denver Airport thing or I mean or even like Disneyland where you'll see like like thirty three and three and certain like numbers okay and okay I know well, you probably I can't go deep details. into it but I, I can go into details on the numbers but first let me let, let me just blow the whole lead on Freemasonry in the Denver Airport. For you right now. Okay. There's a common public Masonic ceremony called the Cornerstone. You go to a big fancy building, there's a Cornerstone. You go to a place where there's, you know, fancy uh, um, time capsules laid, there's a Cornerstone. The Freemason connection to the Denver airport is they put a Cornerstone down. As is typical, the people who are in charge in the city, state, federal government officials are on there. And the two Grand Lodge that performed the dedication are there. You'll note it says on the actual image, dedication capstone is said by the most worshipful Prince Hall Grand Lodge of Colorado and the most worshipful Grand Lodge AF AF and AM of Colorado with the names of the two respective Grand Masters on the stone. That means they supervise the ceremony to put that stone down there. The date is immediately below the square and compass and then Below that is the people who are on the airport commission when the airport was built. Okay. So let's, so I just want to ruin that right now. Basically, it's a signature saying, yes, we were here when this thing was done. I'm putting this rock right here. Okay. Three is the third degree, which is colloquially famous in uh, 
American slang. And 33 is the honorary highest point degree of Scottish Rite Freemasonry, which you get based on a complicated series of factors. Um, every region of the United States has a Scottish Rite body for that region, and they national two Scottish Rite bodies. There's the southern jurisdiction and the northern jurisdiction. The southern jurisdiction controls all the Scottish Rite bodies in the south and the west, and the northern one controls the Midwest, and the Northeast. They have a formula. Each valley of the Scottish Rite has X number of 33rd degree masons assigned to it. So if they're short, somebody gets to get the white hat of a 33rd degree mason. Generally speaking, it's somebody who's had to put in a certain amount of Masonic service, community service, public service, charitable service. Okay. So, um... And this was also the time where the dysfunctional family was a little bit functional. They're all getting together for Thanksgiving. And then that's when this cornerstone was placed, correct? <laughs> right. At, <laughs> okay. at this point in time, the, so the big dispute that was the last straw that we had to get over before Grand Lodges, mine currently hasn't gotten over it yet, have resolved their differences was there was a principle called exclusive territorial jurisdictional sovereignty, where basically this is my jurisdiction. I put my flag here, so I have the right to be sovereign in this jurisdiction. Okay. So they came up with you know legal treaties, agreements, arrangements to say, okay, I have jurisdiction exclusively of all legitimate Freemasons in my Grand Lodge system and any that we recognize except for those guys over there who have exclusive jurisdiction over theirs and anybody they recognize. Okay. Pretty straightforward. So we should, we should get into the Denver. Or should we get into the Denver or should we uh, go over some of the other stuff? Because there's a lot you of You got some there. other Freemasonry stuff because basically the Denver airport, spoiler alert, it has really terrible artwork. <laughs> yeah, let's just get right into it and we can go over some of these other ones later. Yeah. So, okay. So the, the artwork, because there's, um, let me pull up some of these murals. There's there's one that I'm looking at right now where it's it's got like these uh Women holding their, their All child around in a line. secret plant, trying to get high. Yeah, and there's like a big army guy with with a giant saber and with a dove on the yeah. end of it, and a big yeah. rifle, and all this yeah. stuff. And then there's one with like we're supposed to also give... don't forget the rainbow in the background. <laughs> yeah, the rainbow is kind of it's coming <laughs> off of the soldier. And like I don't know, I think it's going area. into the burning building, which is kind of. I don't know what that means. That's confusing to me. Yeah. And uh, there's like a little piece of paper. And if I remember correctly, this little piece of paper is like commemorating Auschwitz or not commemorating. Yeah. Oh, Jesus Christ. No. <laughs> symbolic of. Yeah. It's, is this supposed to be Auschwitz? Is this what this is? It's emblematical of, you know, the Nazis, the Soviets, imperialism, you know, oppression, violence, and war. So what is the relationship with this and Freemasonry? Uh, absolutely none. Okay. It's just a really bad piece of art. <laughs> it's just a really bad piece of public art. Also, uh, there's the little girl in the coffin who's on like a bunch of quilts holding her Bible and some flowers. You know, is which, that the would same? be normal. Yeah. That'd be normal for you to bury a small child in, I guess. Yeah. Was, she's got a teddy bear. Is that a teddy bear? I can't really uh, see this thing. I think it could be. Yeah. I think it is a teddy bear. And she's got like a locket and yeah, she's dead. Yeah. And then there's another one that I'm looking at. Um, With a bunch of burning trees and uh, like a wild turkey. I don't see that one. <laughs> I, okay, so here's the one that I have right now. This is the uh, with a bunch of kids, and they're all holding like flags from around the world. And they're all kind oh, of yeah. holding hands, and it says, "Let's all have peace." Yeah, it's something along the lines of "We need peace." Oh, it's peace in different languages. That's what it is. Yeah, and there's like a dead soldier, or like he's grayed out. Yeah. So what is, what is the connection between this mural and Freemasonry? And I think this is going to be a running theme with all uh, of them. Absolutely none. Okay. It's just really <laughs> shitty art. Just really shitty art. And then there's another one where there's a bunch of people and it looks like from where they're coming from all around the world. And then there's, is that Krishna in the middle with some weird? Uh, yeah. 
Yeah, and, and there's I, I animals know, and flowers and the desert and a jungle and birds flying around and a snow leopard. Yeah, and it looks like they're going to eat the snow leopard, maybe. Or maybe the snow leopard is looking at it like, oh, I could feed this to my cubs, all these people. What exactly no. does this one have to do with Freemasonry? <laughs> Absolutely nothing. It's just shit. Yeah. It, yeah. Now, there are things that it uses that are used in, you know, Freemasonic things like the Quetzalcoatl, that's a specialized organization in the shrine. They help fund that? airlifts. What was it? For sick for? kids. Uh, the Quetzalcoatl, the little bird that's flying by the burning trees. Um, I don't see burning trees. Maybe we're looking at a different one. <laughs> Um, well, no, it's the one where the lady's like sitting in front of the snow leopard, and there's like an Indian. Oh, oh, okay. So we're looking at different ones. Yeah, okay. Oh, so okay. I, I got this one now. We're, we're we're looking at different terrible art. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They, they all kind of they're all so similar. Yeah. Okay. I, I don't know who this artist is, but I would definitely give a one star on Yelp. <laughs> yeah. Like they have some weird shit at the wind sometimes, and every time I go there, I'm like, sometimes it's good, sometimes it's like, what the fuck is this? Like I had like a big Popeye one time, yeah. but none of them are nearly as bad as these. Yeah. <laughs> oh, there's there's also one here where like uh, three heads and like people swirling in a toilet bowl, and there's like a, a Mexican and an American flag chasing the flag of uh, Cesar Chavez's Union down the toilet bowl. Not not entirely sure why that that's a thing. I don't see the toilet. Even when I search for toilet, I don't get that one. <laughs> Just a second. Let me let me pull up the uh, Pinterest for you. Oh uh, no, I see uh, I see a toilet, but that's uh, I mean, it's definitely it, may, not maybe from maybe Denver. I'm just <laughs> reading the maybe I'm just reading the toilet into it. Yeah, that that that's entirely possible. All right, so this one. Yeah, it it's not a toilet, but it, it's <laughs> that's what I'm saying. <laughs> I don't know what that is about. This is just bad. That's the dude down there, I think, who actually made the artwork. So he's the blame. <laughs> yeah, he's got, like, paint stuff, and his pants are all strewn with paint. So, yes, it's that guy's fault. Yeah, I remember MK was uh, talking to me about how she went to the Salvador Dali Museum, and she was telling me about how they were showcasing this other guy's art. That was just terrible. Man, that guy is awesome compared to this crap. <laughs> Everything that I've seen so far has just been... Yeah, I would I would want to tear these things down if I operated that. Now, is is the Denver airport is that a a, a government thing or is that a private owned? Uh, ninety nine percent sure it's a government thing. Okay, let's just go under the the premise that it is a government thing. That would explain a lot of the other questions that I have about this outside of the murals because the murals are just so bad. Now, honestly, like this these murals. Before I go, uh, these murals. They seem like something that I would see like at an elementary school, like a really shitty elementary school. Like you mean the... like a giant blue horse? That's oh, also no. at the airport. <laughs> no, we didn't. I didn't have that at my school. <laughs> yeah, let's before before we leave the art, we completely just glossed over that one. What about the giant blue <laughs> devil devil Mustang? Is it a unicorn? I don't know. No, those are no. It, it, it's a bronco. Yeah, and it, you could see its ribs, and it's got glowing red eyes, and its head no, is almost kind of green looking. It, it doesn't really have anything to do with anything other than the consistency of all this art of just being really terrible art. <laughs> what do they call this thing? I think they call it the the Devil Mustang, right, or something like that. Um, the official name for it from the airport is the Denver Airport Blue Bronco because it's a Bronco and it's blue. It looks like a Mustang. Uh, I don't know enough about how uh, horses work to be able to yeah, tell you. I, I don't know either, but uh, when I saw this, I was like, that looks like a Mustang. I don't that know. That looks like something somebody had a very bad acid trip with. <laughs> I, I've had some I've had some near uh, bad acid trips, but uh, this is this is not that creative. It, it, uh, so it's so it's a blue. It's a blue. It's a blue. Giant uh, blue fiber bus horse. Okay, okay, it's a bronco. Whatever. It's a giant blue bronco, and it's up on its hind legs, and it's kind of doing the you know kicking its front feet like me, yeah. like it's angry. Yeah. Um, and it's you could see it's ri it looks like it's evil. It looks like a zombie almost because it's blue, yeah. and you can see its rib cage, like you can see its ribs through its skin, yeah. and it's just 
it looks like it's you know either starving or from hell and it's got gl- um, glowing red eyes not like oh it's got like a, a tint of red that's really kind of prominent no it's and there we, are lights we definitely know red lights in there yeah yeah we definitely know which choice alex jones would say if he's talking about this horse <laughs> Yeah, like it was almost like the, this was a gift bestowed to Alex Jones saying like, here's like eight months of material for you. <laughs> it is so bizarre. So does this have, I guess it sort of does allegedly uh, have any kind of tie to Freemasonry and it's no, very no. loose. No. I, th- I think the only connection it would be is because a lot, maybe some of them are Christians and Christians do believe in the four horsemen of the apocalypse. <laughs> and this might be representative of what that narrative narrative could be. Or it could be the lesser known six horsemen of losing your luggage. <laughs> <laughs> So I want you to check the cavity of that thing. Now, <laughs> something interesting did, and, and probably for the best, uh, something interesting did happen under the construction of this horse. Do you know what that is? Uh, somebody died? Yeah. The artist who created this thing, I guess while they were, I think he, he was still making it or they are constructing it there, uh, the, the head or whatever fell onto him and he died. Um, from they the should have really just left the head where it was. Yeah, just <laughs> right on. Th- <laughs> left his body there and be like, "Remember, the next time you create shitty art, this could happen to you." <laughs> Honestly, like I don't think it's that bad. I just think it's really bad. <laughs> <laughs> it's a really bad place <laughs> to be putting like something at, like especially if you're going to an airport. Also, and a lot of people have look- like fear of like, getting on an airplane, right? If you have fear mm-hmm. getting on an airplane, you're like, okay, I'm trying to relax. And of course, you have like, all these beautiful murals and stuff. Giant but, demon horse. But before you get into it, you see the demon horse of the apocalypse staring you down as you're entering the airport. It's not really uh, a reassuring <laughs> image. And of course, the picture that I have, you can see thunderclouds behind it. And, and also. <laughs> You know, that's just like such a weird, cheesy piece of art to go with like a 1990s contemporary style airport. It just doesn't make sense. Yeah. But the, the so a lot of the things that are kind of revolving around it doesn't really necessarily revolve around Freemasonry, but we'll just kind of brush over them real quick. It was way over budget. I think the budget for it was like two billion dollars and ended up going over like up to, almost up to five or six, depending on who you're talking to. A government transportation project that goes over budget yeah, into that, multiple billions of dollars. That's never happened or take take longer than expected. Where's that California rail that was supposed to happen a couple years ago? Well, it, it's still happening. Just, you know, they need another $10 billion. Yeah. So yeah, government. Oh, push. wait, wait. Yeah, I mean, they need $20 billion more billion and they'll finish that railroad. <laughs> Just $30 I, billion more dollars. I don't think I'm ever going to see that railroad. I think the X train is actually probably going to get built before, <laughs> long before <laughs> it's done. And they had a long projected uh, time frame when that was going to be taking place. Uh, Denver. So is this an um, international airport? I'm trying to see it if, is. It, uh, if it's owned by anybody. And location serves operator. Yeah, city and county of um, Department of Aviation. That's the operator yep. and owner. So, okay. So, this yep. is a government project. Confirmed. So they had, so they had a uh, government uh, bid for the art, and the lowest bidder came in and won. Yeah, still too much. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, they. they, This was just all around bad, all of it. So, um, and then the other thing is that there's a series of underground tunnels, uh, and I guess large areas underground where you can, where it looks like it could possibly retrofitted into a FEMA camp. <laughs> uh, possibly, AKA or, you know, concentration like, camp. Yeah, yeah. They pump in the chemicals that turn the frogs gay. Of course. <laughs> It's where they make. Actually, no, it's not. It's it's actually owned by Alex Jones, and that's where they make Caveman <laughs> and all of his soy uh, soy based products, soy based supplements. <laughs> but everybody else is a soy boy. <laughs> yeah. Like, I, so all that stuff. It's it. I guess the original intention was to use it as sort of like an underground trans 
transfer of uh, baggage or mm-hmm. storage areas. Uh, but I think they just got a little bit too too ambitious <laughs> with them. But you know, hey, if uh, Kim Jong Il launches nukes, it's a good fallout shelter. Hey, why not? Yeah. Everybody's concerned that uh, that North Korea is going to nuke us. <laughs> and oh no, they built a bomb shelter in the bottom of the Denver airport. Pick one. <laughs> you can only have one of these things. Yeah. So, I mean, that none of that really has anything to do with Freemasonry, unless there's like a no. Freemason thing where they're all no. about bomb, building bomb shelters. Yeah, no. I think so. We're, we're... So. Again, we're, we're we're just connected to this because of some uh, bad artistic choices. Yeah, bad artistic choices and a cornerstone. Yeah. Oh, and, and and a swastika because clearly the Nazis had everything <laughs> to do with Freemasonry. So what is what well, is what is the uh, Hitler the Hitler did ban us? I mean, <laughs> Hitler did ban us, and uh, Freemasons were to some degree treated differently than other American soldiers that were arrested. For better, but then better or worse. It, Worse. Okay. Then you get to all sorts of interesting apocryphal stories. So I can't tell you any of what I tell you is true. This is only the story that was told to me. Well, but before we do, okay. we should talk about why we're talking about this first. Because it's alleged that the Denver airport is shaped like a swastika. Which yeah. It, which it's very much not. But when you first look at it, it's it's kind of like your first kind of like, oh, is that a swastika? It kind of looks like a swastika because it's so ingrained in the American culture, like yeah. swastika bad. But then when you like look at it for the second second that you look at it, you're like, oh, no, no. That's just that's just, that was just a normal airport. Yeah. Okay. But, but yeah, so- we should talk about whether or not – because if, if the Freemasons are using this as some sort of conspiracy, um, why would they shape it in the, in the thing of a no- yeah. Nazi? Because yeah. – it would, we wouldn't. Yeah. <laughs> it would be very... So Adolf Hitler banned the Freemasons, though the exact reason why is kind of historically vague due to the fact that, you know, there was Hitler bombings, destruction of documents. Likewise, Joseph Stalin did it. So basically, pretty much any totalitarian regime bans the Freemasons outright. Yeah, they don't like... And, to, they like to control all the secrets. Well, they like to control everything. That's yeah. the whole point of being a totalitarian. You're in total control of everything until you realize you're in control of nothing. So um, Freemasons went underground in Germany. So as I was going through my first three degrees, old timer who was teaching me was an army colonel, served in World War II, and he was recounting a story about he and another Freemasonic officer were detained by the Germans and the Waffen SS was interrogating him. And there is a particular line of Masonic ritual that a Mason says when he's in a situation where he expects his life is in imminent danger. And immediately the German army officer came into the tent, told the SS officer the interrogation was over. He was taking possession of them per the Geneva conventions to take them to military internment camp for soldiers that were captured. Hmm. And there are all sorts of stories like this in the background of the war. And if we go to like the American Civil War, there were also all sorts of little Masonic history going on in the background that was not dissimilar. Okay. So Hitler wasn't a fan of us, and there were German Freemasons who went underground very likely some of them were probably in the German military and weren't jerks. But, you know, they were in the German military for complex social issues that had to do with things like Prussian military tradition and nonsense like that. Okay. So I, th- I think that pretty much covers the Denver airport stuff. <laughs> yeah. I think. Was, yeah. was there anything else in the Denver airport stuff? Because it was mostly just the murals, the horse, and the cornerstone yeah. that everybody freaks yeah. out about. Oh, and the layout. Yeah. Um, and, it's and you'd think that this would be less of an issue now that it's legal to smoke weed in the Denver airport. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> no, now it's more of an issue because now everybody gets high, go to the airport and goes, whoa. whoa. Yeah. That, that I think, then again, like I'm highly sensitive to, to, to weed anyway. And it makes me ultra paranoid. If I saw that thing, I'd probably freak out if I'd never heard of or seen of it before. Yeah. yeah. All right, so let's get into some of the other stuff around it because, yeah, the Freemason stuff around the Denver airport and a lot of the other stuff around Denver airport, a bunch of crap. 
Yeah. Um, so are is the Freemasons uh, a Zionist group? Not not no. whether or not members support them, but is it like is their goal have anything to do with Zionism? There is no official policy about Zionism, other than the fact that there is a Grand Lodge in Israel. Okay. Uh, is the second attempt to form a Masonic Lodge in Israel. One was attempted to form back in the days of Mandate Palestine. Uh, no, excuse me. Tried to form under Turkish administration. A bunch of expatriates tried to start a Grand Lodge in Israel. Didn't actually get off the ground until after the founding of the State of Israel. Okay. There is an active Masonic Lodge currently in Turkey, though they're fearful that the way things are going in Turkey, they're going to get banned. Okay. There was a Masonic Lodge in Iran, but when the Shah got ousted, they left too. Yeah, I, I would have left too. Well, the Shah wasn't uh, great either. <laughs> there was a Masonic Lodge in Syria. I don't know the history of it, but it shut down in like the 50s or 60s. Same for the one in Lebanon. Yeah. So yeah, I, I didn't think there would be any connection between the two, but I I did see that some of the stuff was accusing it of being like a Zionist front organization, right? Or that or that it had goals. Now I'm sure that there's people there who who would be pro Zion, yeah. Zion, yeah. yeah, yeah, and yeah. some that may not Cause, be, yeah, because you know that that's just normal, yeah, <laughs> just normal people doing normal Freemasonry stuff. within the Anglo American continuum by and large avoids politics okay so that's why are are there do do normally do the some of them kind of lean in different directions politically well let me just put it this way if you go to new york visit a masonic lodge and it's prohibited to speak politics in the lodge but if you go to a bar afterwards with guys in the lodge they're going to be probably slightly right of center of the average person in New York. Okay. You go in Florida, they're going to be right to center of who you're going to run into in Florida. Okay. So, so it's not it, mostly conservative, big, maybe some libertarian. Yeah. Okay. In areas that are mostly conservative and libertarian. Okay. So the next, and one, if you're in an area that's mostly liberal or moderate, they'll be more liberal and moderate. Oh, okay. Political. Are are there Democrat? Yeah. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Very very uh, unified these guys are. Um, <laughs> uh, the other one would be like the Trayvon Martin shooting because I've I've seen this before. Oh, that's kind of complicated. So, okay, remember how we talked about Prince Hall lodges? Yeah. So. African American Freemasonry, because they broke away from the status quo, people within African American Freemasonry broke off and formed their own status quo as well. Trayvon Martin's father or stepfather, I forgot which, is in one of those Masonic lodges. Um, I think he's in the National Compact Grand Lodge. Of Florida, but don't hold me to that. I think he may have come from a group that split off from the National Compact Grand Lodge. And just to kind of retrace things, when the Prince Hall Grand Lodges first started, they did have a national organization because they were smaller and needed to have that to survive. But once they reached a critical mass, they split apart and do state organizations. However, certain members didn't like that. So they pretended like the vote to split off into state organizations didn't actually happen. Hmm. They said, no, 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 those records are all fake. Okay. So there wasn't a Freemason conspiracy. No. At least on the part of most <laughs> Freemasons, because no. it's probably even a no. small sect of them. Now, the big thing you're going to want to get to talk about is the juicy thing is the Morgan affair in the United States. Morgan affair. I don't know what this is. Okay, so the first Mas political party formed in the United States was the Anti Masonic Party. That has to do to a man by the name of Morgan, who illicitly snuck into Masonic lodges. 
back in the old days, that was a lot easier. So long as you knew the signs, modes of recognition, the handshakes and things, and you could talk a good game, you could get into a lodge. And if you paid your dues to that lodge, you were on the up and up. So he snuck in, faked his way through various Masonic organizations, and was going to write a tell-all book. There's some dispute as to whether a group of angry Masons murdered him, or whether he died of other causes. He was also generally disreputable, so he may have had other people try to kill him. The, the uh, fake news of its day decided to say that the Masons tried to kill him. Okay. And that nearly destroyed Freemasonry in the United States. All right. <laughs> and the Freemasons who were very active in the Civil War era were of the generation that were rebuilding Freemasonry. And then Civil War obviously caused problems because a whole bunch of people got killed. And then the generation that helped build up the country after the Civil War started the golden age of Freemasonry in the United States. And it was the golden age of fraternal organizations. Boy Scouts, Rotary, all those sorts of things really got their start during that era. And that was trucking along until the Great Depression, and the Great Depression nearly killed Freemasonry in the United States. Yeah. And then the post-war era gave it a little bit of a boost. And then the hippie generation, they didn't kill it, but it's been... The hippies didn't join anything, but hippies started getting into lodges, you know, reformed hippies in like the 80s, 90s, and 2000. Okay. Is that where all the rituals came from? Just like bad no. acid trips? Okay. No. The, the, <laughs> the original rituals go all the way back to at least 1714 in England. Okay. So, uh, like, so I know, I know the, the United States, like a lot of the founders, you'll see like pictures of them with, you know, like them standing with like a Masonic thing above them, like the Masonic symbol, which is the G and the compass and the square. Yeah. Today I learned what that was. T I T I L. Um, yeah. <laughs> it was the square and the the compass and the G. You'll see like that. Um, and then lots uh, of the founders were Freemasons, but less than you would think. Yeah. I mean, yeah, Franklin was hellfire. Well, yeah, Franklin yeah. was very active Masonically and. Remember how I mentioned that there were two different Grand Lodges in the United Kingdom at one point in time? Mm -hmm. Well, those two Grand Lodges set up their franchises in the United States. Uh, the Grand Lodge in Colorado is an ancient Grand Lodge because it came from one pedigree. Lodge in Florida is just free and accepted Masons, which means it comes from the modern pedigree. So Franklin belonged to one Grand Lodge, but all of its constituent lodges ceased to exist in the other Grand Lodge franchise took over Pennsylvania. But they made Ben Franklin a member because, well, he's Ben Franklin. Okay. Thomas Jefferson was not a Freemason, though he was popularly believed to be one, but again, you kind of get into... That's one of those things like he had opportunities that may not have been recorded in the history books or may have been lost to history, but you can't conclusively prove he was a member. Though he had many friends who were and was likely influenced by them when there are like Masonic ideas about freedom, self-governance, uh, being down on censorship. Okay. So like a, a lot of that, would, so maybe Western civilization wasn't forged by the Christians, but rather the Freemasons. <laughs> well, no, uh, we, the Freemasons were started as an enlightenment movement. Okay. And as such, they advocate very strongly for enlightenment values. Okay. And they were the best people pushing enlightenment values in continental America, which helped influence the founding of the United States. That and, um, or was, it, was it John Locke? Yeah, John Locke. Yeah. Was he a Mason too, or? Uh, not that I'm aware of. Okay. Now, if you want to go into famous Europeans, you have to get into people like uh, Mozart. Was very active as a Mason, but I'm not as good on... Famous people in Europe who are Mason. All right. They're all American, American. <laughs> so um, we should talk before we talk about Albert Pike. Because I've, right, seen, so I've Albert seen this. Pike. I see, well, hold on, I, I've seen this name kind of come up a lot when I used to kind of go after okay. the kind of zeitgeist 
people <clears throat> and not really like the zeitgeist yeah. movement where they're talking about yes. um because know, like, most of them quote a forged document from albert pike that was oh. written and published after he died so so who was albert pike first okay so albert pike was an amazing individual who was self-taught self-educated published his own newspaper uh, went to Ivy League schools back when you just basically had to show up and take a test there, and they'd say, oh, okay, you can go. He was a lawyer. He was a general for the Confederacy, but he wasn't a really good general for the Confederacy. He was trying to recruit and organize the Native American tribes into a military unit for the Confederacy, and he was terrible at that. He was also a lawyer who defended Native American tribes against the federal government in court, and he is the only confederate one of the two confederate generals who has a statue honoring them in the united states capitol he's in the statuary garden that basically prominent lawyers who went in front of the supreme court have a statue there so so since he was a general of the confederacy are we going to expect some sjw's to try to knock that statue down <laughs> um they, they've been trying for a while oh, already really yes now he ended up and I don't remember the exact series of events, but he ended up becoming in charge of the ancient and accepted Scottish Rite Southern jurisdiction, which is most of the United States. So the Scottish Rite was not doing as well on membership wise. So he solved that problem using lots of very smart tactics, like getting all the prominent Masons he could in various states that were suspicious of Scottish Rite Masonry to join and then become advocates for the organization. Okay. After he did that, he then went about rewriting all the rituals. And what he did was he took the themes, ideas, uh, tone, and whatnot of the rituals, wrote them down on a long list, and went to talk to the anthropology department at the University of Chicago. And they gave him all sorts of ideas on how to rewrite the Scottish Rite rituals. And this, in turn, helped make the Southern jurisdiction of the Scottish Rite very successful. The Shrine, years later, helped it become even more successful. I'll get to that in a moment. So when he did this, he wrote a very large text, which is an excellent cure for insomnia, called Morals and Dogma, which is a compilation of all these ideas these scholars gave him, as well as various other Masonic thinkers, into a tome kind of explaining the philosophy and symbolism and ideas behind the 32 Scottish Rite degrees, of which the Scottish Rite only performs 29. Because the first three degrees, to help them function in the United States properly, they agreed not to do. Okay. So what was the uh, the forged document that... Um... That Albert Pike uh, basically, that it was it talking about. For a <laughs> he claimed it claimed he was the leader of Freemasonry, and he was authorizing this, that, and the other thing. And uh, yeah, he'd been dead several years when the letter was published, and okay. the year on the letter, he was dead before that. Uh, okay. Other interesting things he was responsible for: he made the first public library in Washington D.C. Not kind of the Library of Congress, because most people in the city couldn't get access to. It. And he made it out of his own personal book collection. Oh, interesting! I know has, he also done a lot of work with like, um, like comparative history, yes, with, with religion and stuff like that too. Yes. Which I know that you and I completely disagree on. Is that does that have anything to do with that, or or is it just? It has to do with some of his ideas about the ideas contained within Freemasonry, but in his book, Morals and Dogma, that he wrote about it in, and he didn't write most of the book, but he was the editor, and so he kind of wrote the book. He said, these are just my ideas, and they're not authoritative of anything else beyond what I believe. Okay. I was just wondering that, because I, I kept hearing his name being kind of thrown up, uh, mostly with yeah. like fellow critics of and i'm not talking about like the zeitgeist movement where they're talking about robot yeah. utopia i'm talking about yeah. the first part of the the first film where they go over yeah. comparative religions and christianity and astro theology and all that stuff and now that pike was also a very big believer in a lot of the theories of indo-europeanism which is kind of faded out of popularity but there are like any 
theory that was valuable enough that was discussed for years in the higher sources of education, there are some valuable ideas within it. Yeah. All right. So the next one, and I'm kind of using now I'm kind of using Wikipedia as a <laughs> as a crutch because going over some of the, the, the Masonic conspiracies. Um, for, <laughs> Freemasons worship Baal, Baphomet, D- Dahl and Rau. Well, what are those last two? Did you say Ryu from like Street Fighter? <laughs> right. Well, it's R A H U, and then D J J A L. I think nah. it's either Dajal or Dahal. Yeah, no, nah, nah. I don't even know what that is, and not even Satanists worship the Baphomet. Basically, <laughs> in Freemasonry, there's a placeholder name for God within the United States. I've not gone to those few jurisdictions that exclude non-Christians from being members. But there are placeholder names for God that says, hey, you fill it in with whatever you believe in. All right. So so there may be Freemasons who worship Baal. Uh, unlikely. That would be <laughs> unlikely. <laughs> Baphomet, I highly doubt that. I mean, the weirdest thing I've ever encountered in a Masonic Lodge is I met somebody who was not a sovereign citizen, but was part of the sovereign state movement. What Are you is, familiar with those weirdos? No. The sovereign state movement believes that state governments are legitimate, but the national government isn't. They believe the state government's legitimate, but not the federal. Right. Okay. <laughs> I could like them. <laughs> I could like them. I don't know if I would agree with him. Um, well, they're all illegitimate. That's that's my problem. Uh, <laughs> so what is got to G A O T U great, great architect. architect of the universe. Okay. Basically the creator with the maker, the maker, which you would see in lots of sci-fi books, same sort of thing. Okay. What does that have to do with three masonry? <laughs> that is one of our placeholder names for God in Masonic function and ritualism. Okay. So it's not like a, a weird occult. No. Okay. Um, <clears throat> so what, now the numerology that I keep seeing now that I see this on this list is numerology. I'll probably bring it back. Yeah. So I, when, when you go to uh, Disneyland and you start looking at some of the older stuff that was at Disneyland, well, Disney was still alive because Disney was a Freemason. Yes, he was. Uh, okay. He was also a member of the Order of Dean Malay, which I was involved in, and so was Bill Clinton. Okay. Well, oh, is Bill Clinton a Freemason? I don't know. Bill Clinton is not a Freemason. He includes two pages of his explanation of why in my life. The explanations are stupid, and Bill actually knew the answer to those questions better, but he was lying to sell the book to a mass market audience. Okay. Wait, Bill Clinton lied? I know. <laughs> that, that is difficult to believe. Oh, Jesus. <laughs> and also in Arkansas, the Masonic Lodge in Arkansas has been involved in various controversies. They have not yet, you know, embraced the colored lodge in Arkansas, which is what they would probably call it, because it has the colored folk in it. Mm. Um, so, if you're a man like Bill Clinton running to be governor of Arkansas and you're a Democrat, that's probably not a good, not a good scene for you to be in. Yeah. So the the numerology stuff, yeah. So you you'll you'll see stuff there, and it, a lot of it will be like there's there's three of these things, and there's like thirty three over here, and yeah. you'll see like symbols over here and numerology. And <clears throat> I remember in a good portion of the uh, the book, Behold the Pell Horus, he talks about like a lot of like he has like a set of numbers, and mm-hmm. and it was a long set of numbers. I don't even know exactly if a lot of these kind of numbers are even relevant. I think he probably just made some of them up. Um, but you can pretty much add, subtract, and put together things and find a number yeah. in those things anywhere. But there there are certain ones that you kind of see over and over again, like thirty three three and all that stuff. Yeah. Uh, is what what exactly why is is this kind of like like one of those things where you kind of like uh, okay. virtue signaling <laughs> when, okay. when, they, so, when they do things like that so the reason the completion of your first three degrees in freemasonry is three is because of pre-existing biblical and non-biblical symbolism for the number three so basically all the symbolism you can think of of numerology 
predates the Freemasons, and the Freemasons incorporated that in. Uh, kind of like Father, Son, Holy Spirit, that sort of thing? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, exactly. Okay. Yeah. So are, do the they... Romans had a, the Romans had three trinities of principal deities, depending on different periods of Roman history. Yeah, yeah. It, it, it's a thing. Yeah, because sometimes when I get when I start making stuff in like Photoshop or, um, sometimes when I write blogs or or pieces or stuff like that, I'll like put certain things in there that are almost kind of like nods to people or mm-hmm. nods to certain ideas or, or certain people that I know that those people will pick up on and then end up going like, Hey, I saw yeah. that. That's kind of neat that you do that in there. And there's only like a couple people who actually will pick up on that. Is it sort of like the same thing where they're just kind of like, Oh, Hey, kind of, yeah. They all got together I, and they were like, Hey, you know, what'd be kind of cool <clears throat> is if we put a compass in there just to fuck with people. And we're going <laughs> to, we're going to, we're going to take a little pause here for a moment. Okay. So I'm Jewish and I converted to Judaism. Okay. And as I converted to Judaism, there are certain things that I was a lot more active when I was first joined Judaism. And I've become like most other Jews and I'm kind of lazy about religion. As I converted, there were certain things that were part of the liturgy that came from the Bible are things that were focused on as biblical allegories and symbolism within Masonic ritual and done for similar purposes. But that's because there are core truths that were there biblically that were being taken out and being put in Masonic ritual for the same reason. Okay. That makes sense. So so a lot of it is kind of like nodding. Kind of. Okay. Kind of. Yeah. Because there's certain things that I do that I, that I would kind of do that just so like other people pick up on it. Like, oh, yeah, mm, I know what you're up to, Jim. <laughs> I'm not going to say what. You're going to have to figure that out yourself. Um, so, yeah, we've already talked about the United States. Um, talked about Aleister Crowley. We've yeah. talked about the Mormons. And nine. We've talked about the Nazis. Nine, we've talked about why the radical Muslims hate us. Yeah. 9 11 and then 2001, which adds up to three. <laughs> numerology is we can go over just all of the numerological bullshit you can add subtract and put together numbers in any way shape or form and you can get any result that you possibly want by using that at all yeah. numerology is the biggest load of horse shit on the face of the planet <laughs> like just 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 how numbers work it's just you, you can manipulate them in any way shape and form which is why you also hear the, the line there's three kinds of lies. There's lies, damn lies, and statistics. Because you can also lie yep. by using and certain also, statistics. also, in Babylon 5, the truth is a three-edged sword. Yeah, what was... Uh, no, uh, reality is a three-edged sword. You're... Wait, what is and the truth, but yeah. And three is a stable shape, right? It can't be yeah. anything than what it is. Three is the most basic stable shape. Yeah. Uh, a, squ- uh, a square or a rectangle is wobbler. You know, it can follow the left, mm-hmm. it can follow the right. It can become a parallelogram, mm-hmm. right? right. <laughs> I mean, whatever. I don't know. <clears throat> Time cube. Um. So, did d- did you guys fake the moon landing? <laughs> uh, no. <laughs> that could be. There's a that really show awesome that epic video from that guy who explained. I don't know if we landed on the moon, but I do know we didn't have the technology to fake the moon landing back in 1969. Yeah. I don't know. I wasn't there. But I... I wasn't there. <laughs> yeah. Um, what was it called? Moon hoax? Not. I remember it had like a weird title. Yeah, but that, that that's one of those definitive YouTube videos that you, you should always watch. Yeah. All right. I'll find that video. <laughs> oh, yeah. Moon. No, that's not even it. It's just someone linking to it. And I can't click on it to find a link because it'll start playing. Yeah, but if you look up uh, Moon Hoax Not, I guess you can probably find it. I wonder if I could stop it before it plays. Yeah, there we go. Uh, His name is SG Collins. Yeah. Yeah. Man. College humor people have even uh, t- taken that guy's shine. That yeah. uh, what's his face? Uh, Adam ruins everything. He also ruins the internet. 
with substandard versions of other people's original content. Yeah, you know what? Like when that show first came out, like the first season I, I liked, and he was also hinting at that he was going to talk about how global warming wasn't going to be as bad as everybody says it's going to be. Okay, so the video is called Moon Hoax not and you'll know it's the right one because it's got over two million views so anyways yeah like and and uh, i thought a lot of them were really good and i remember the original <coughs> shorts that he used to do for college humor and that was like some of the good stuff that came out of college humor like college humor is usually garbage but that some yeah. of that stuff was good and then yeah now he's on this kick where he's talking about all sorts of stuff that's just sjw yeah. level bullshit <laughs> like just yeah. complete crap and it's kind of sad because i really wanted to see him take on a global warming from a really different perspective because i do have that kind of different perspective so humanoid reptiles are you guys really lizard people <laughs> no no the closest we get to that is that the queen that kingdom is the official patron of the grand lodge who wait who the queen is okay. the official patron of well, the grand she's, lodge she's a lizard yeah <laughs> or or she's in charge of the world heroin trade if you want to believe lynn and larouche <laughs> No, you, you, you oh, I love Lyndon Rouge. Yeah, I love Lyndon Rouge's crap. I just love listening yeah. to him just talk. But it's kind of weird. You can tell that he can, he's making that shit up on the spot. Too. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> it's kind of, it's kind of weird how if you take the whole all the stuff that uh, Icky's written about the reptilian conspiracy theories and replace lizards with Jews, and it sounds exactly <laughs> like people who are writing about the protocols of the elders of Zion. Yeah. That's so yeah. weird. Yeah. Um. Is Jack the Ripper? Robert Cavalli and JFK. Okay. That is one of the pop culture mythology things about uh, Freemasonry that most people get wrong because there's nothing pop culture related that was remotely Masonically similar involving his killings. People, however, interpret that because of unique, weird fears and conspiracies about Freemasonry in the UK because the Freemasons in the UK are much more secretive than they are here in the United States. And in Europe, they're to a lesser extent more secretive. Um, people just assume the Freemasons were covering it up. Okay. Basically, anytime anything bad goes on, the British police or judiciary, people in the UK like to blame the Freemasons for no reason. Uh, JFK, no, we wouldn't want to kill him. Because if you assume the Masons are an evil global conspiracy theory, why would we want to assassinate JFK for a person who wasn't able to complete his Masonic degrees? Lyndon Johnson quit two thirds of the way into the beginning. Hmm. So that, that doesn't even make sense. If you assume that that, that sort of insane world exists. Yeah. And I already did a show entirely. That was actually the first one of these things that I do every 25 episodes, uh, was I, I covered the JFK assassination and why it's not. So you can go back and listen to episode 25. Yeah. Um, Robert, uh, Roberto Calvi, I said that wrong the first time. Is that the guy who was the banker in London? Yes. The Italian baker dubbed okay. God's banker. So this gets into some kind of interesting stuff and I'm going to go outside of the, most of the stuff I'm saying is stuff that I'm fairly knowledgeable on. There's going to be some speculative stuff. So remember we talked about clandestine Masonic lodges, lodges that were formed for an illicit public purpose. Mm -hmm. so there was a clandestine Masonic lodge founded in Italy that was formed for the purpose of stealing money from the Vatican. And money that just happened to go to a lot of Polish anti-communist resistance people, you might have heard of them, called Solidarity. Yeah. Now, he died. Of course, you know, he was embezzling from the Vatican Bank. So I imagine he was doing all sorts of things that would have somebody kill him. <laughs> yeah. His death has elements that people could reasonably argue were Masonic, but no. Unless there are things that, you know, MI5 has been withholding, or MI6 and whatever has been withholding from the public. Based on the publicly known facts in his death, there is nothing that is actually Masonic there. There's stuff that people could imply or infer, but you know how you get with when you're using green text. Yeah. <laughs> I knew green text would come up somewhere in this conversation. <laughs> it, it has to come up because green text is the highest form of debate. Yeah, it is. Um, 
so I think I think I think the big one would be the um the Eye of Providence province. Is that what it is? I have Providence. I have Providence. Um the dollar bill. The the, the Oh, okay. So All seeing eye. All seeing eye of God, like an old Christian symbol that you know has been used by multiple religions. Incompleted pyramid represents the incomplete perfection of all sorts of things. Not Masonically oriented. There were Masons who were involved in designing that, but the person who actually did the final design wasn't a Mason. Mm-hmm. Okay. And the New World Order. I think that pretty much wraps it up. <laughs> I think you mean the the thing that George W. Uh, George Herbert Walker Bush said in a speech. Yeah. To refer to the post-communist world order, and everybody is taken off sideways with. Yeah. And, no, and George Herbert Walker Bush isn't a Mason either. Yeah. <laughs> well, he was a skull and bones man. It's the same thing. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> it's the same thing. It's all Illuminati. Yeah. yeah the. Yeah, like that. That one always drives me up the wall when people talk about the new world order. Um, even even in terms of wrestling, because wrestling is the lowest form of entertainment. Um, and uh, yeah, also like, the military industrial complex is one of my pet peeves because what Eisenhower was talking about wasn't the military industrial complex. He's talking about when private in- institutions and entities and governmental institutions and entities weave together. That they are naturally corrupting and they naturally subvert the democratic process. It's kind of weird. I yeah. wonder if somebody should listen to that. <laughs> yeah, and a lot of that stuff is really just well, what do we do now that the Soviet Union is gone? We have all this kind of a lot of the economy was kind of based on like, well, we should gear up for a possible war with this giant behemoth uh, nation that's got that's got not only just the atom bomb, but it also has the H bomb, who's very hostile to us. You know, there could, we could be at any minute now. We can be at global thermal global nuclear war, as uh, Larouche would say. <laughs> so, like any minute now, this could possibly happen. But that that threat was gone. And China was start was, had already opened up relations to the United States. Uh, the Viet Cong is already starting to kind of calm down. Like the only real terrible nation left was North Korea. You know, and oh, uh, that's and a Burma. whole other kettle of fish. Yeah. Nah. So you had all all these things that we were so concerned about. But what do we do now that we don't have this looming threat over us? That's what he was talking about when he was mm-hmm. talking about this, yeah, the new world order. We're facing a new world order. It's not a new world order where we're going to fake an alien invasion <laughs> to unite the world under one world government like Majesty 12. No, no, no. He was talking about, like, what do we do now? We have all this infrastructure and stuff now. We have, like, almost <clears throat> we're, we're coming to a world where there's actually world peace. Not really. No. But, yeah. But it's, it's, it's getting closer. Something... Yeah. Now, remember, I mentioned to you how, you know, we don't know how old Freemasonry actually is. Mm -hmm. There is a, there was a secret society at one point in time in China that used Masonic-like symbolism. Okay. So we, we, we got no clue as to anything about that. Or, you know, whether, like, there was some early European version of Freemasonry that Marco Polo brought them. We, we, we just don't know. Yeah. Or maybe they just saw stuff like that and thought it was interesting. Well, no, no. This was stuff that, that, like, popped up in, like, the 14, 15, 1600s in China. Oh. So, yeah, we, 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 we don't know. Uh, it, it could be just, like, a dragon situation where, like, dearly it could culture be. has a dragon. <laughs> it could be. Okay. Yeah. So Freemasonry, do <laughs> you want to wrap this up and talk about it, what it is? And if people um, are interested, Freem- what they can do to... Freemasonry is the world's oldest fraternal organization. We dedicate ourselves to helping good men become better men. If you're interested, go to the internet. Google in Grand Lodge of blank for whatever your state is. They'll have a website. Look for your town on the website. There'll be a lodge there. Show up to their lodge. They'll also usually have a website that'll have their events. There'll be certain events that'll just be straight up open to the public. They're not open up to the public. You show up early and say, hey, I'm interested in joining. It's really that simple. If you know two people who are Freemasons in your area, then it's even easier. You say, hey, I'm interested in joining, and they'll help you go through the whole process. Right. And you'll learn all the, the handshakes and 
all that stuff. Yeah. Well, not the coffin thing. That's skull and bones. <laughs> 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 Laying in the coffin. Yeah. <sighs> yeah. That's pretty much it. You don't have to, you don't have to send a hundred dollars to nope. to Anton LaVey's heir. Or nope, you don't anything. have to do that. Don't have to do any of that stuff. I'm not going to do that. No. I mean, if you join a Masonic Lodge, though, depending on where you're at, you have to pay a month. You have to pay yearly dues. Okay. And you have to pay fees to join. You get, you know, stuff when you join. Yeah. But like any organization. Yeah, like cool medals. The one that Albert Pike was wearing. In it. <laughs> now, those, the, that takes, you know, yeah, more that than just money. That takes time and work. <laughs> That's some metal he's wearing. <laughs> the, the 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 bow around it's actually bigger than than the metal itself. Yeah. It's amazing. Yeah. Neat, neat. Well, thank you for uh, for coming on. Uh, do you have anything you want to plug? Anything you're doing outside of nothing? Nothing that's plug worthy yet. But yeah, you're I, not I'm even on Twitter I, anymore. For shame. I know. I I, I, do, I still technically have a Twitter, but I don't really use it for anything. Yeah. Periodically, I'll poke out a medium. And of course, you don't you don't partake in 4chan. Clearly not. Clearly not. And if you or if you did, you would or, know who or anyway. Or infinite chan, because again, you're anonymous there. Yeah. Unless you're someone like William Chatner who owns up to it on Twitter. <laughs> Uh, face fag. So, anyways, <laughs> yeah. Thanks for coming out. <laughs> I'll talk to you later, man. Later, later man. Yeah.